We're on. Excellent. Well, you just learned a lot about me. So before I get started into the meat of my presentation, I want to learn a little bit about you guys. So can you just by a quick show of hands, and I guess this is going to be limited to the people in the room, so I'll assume you're a representative sample and let the statisticians correct me later. Um, of the groups that you represent, the companies or groups or whatever that you represent, um, how many of you manufacture non-sterile drug products? Just to say intentionally non-sterile. We won't get into anything else with that. All right, so a good, a good, a good bunch. And how many of you do work in microbiology within your companies? Or microbiologists? All right. Way to go, guys. That's awesome. So excellent. So um, as my introducer said, I'm a microbiologist from the Division of Microbiology Assessment. And what I'd like to discuss with you today concerns our sort of current thinking, some current thinking, some current topics that we've put together regarding the microbiological controls for non-sterile products. Well, already, already flummoxed. Already got me. I'll just use the mouse. I will not do that. Can I just use the arrow keys? That would be fun. All right, let's do that. All right. Oh, there we go. All right. So as Bob already mentioned this morning, um, the Division of Microbiology Assessment is part of the Office of Process and Facilities. And while the bulk of work that we do involves the review of applications for sterile products, we do also assess and participate in the assessment of non-sterile products as well. And that sort of overarching view of the field has given us some insight into the unique risks that these products pose. So since we have this sort of conglomeration of information, that's allowed us to formulate some current thinking on the topic, which I'm pleased to be able to pass along to you today. Now, since I know that we're not all microbiologists, it's OK. Everybody's perfect. We are going to start out with just a couple of really brief Micro 101 slides, just so that we're all starting off on the same footing. All right? So we do know microorganisms, and here I'm talking about bacteria, yeast, and molds, they're ubiquitous in the environment. They're everywhere. They're on skin. They're on surfaces. They're in water. Um, most of them are entirely harmless to humans, but some we refer to as pathogens can cause disease. And the manufacturers of products, such as foods, cosmetics, drug products, are going to work very hard to control the microbiological aspects of these products. And different types of products require different levels of control. So we know that some pharmaceutical products have to be sterile, meaning they can contain no viable microorganisms. And those are things like our injections, our ophthalmics, some of our inhalation products. But most dosage forms don't have to be sterile. But they do have to have limits and controls on the numbers and types of microorganisms that they might contain. And the reason that we can have products that are non-sterile, that are administered to people, is because the human body has natural defenses that prevent infection after a normal exposure to microorganisms. However, if the body is exposed to too many microorganisms or the wrong types of microorganisms, this can overwhelm the body's defenses and lead to an infection. This is one kind of interesting aside to think about really quickly. We have a product that you would normally associate with being for non sterile products. So think of a topical, something that's administered to the skin. If you were to have a topical product, that's intended to be administered to a patient whose natural defenses are broken down. So if they have a bad burn or a deep wound or something like that, that's an example of a time where such a product may need to be manufactured as sterile just to protect the patient from that risk of infection. So that's just, just a little aside to keep in mind what we're talking about here. 
most of the time, the defenses are intact and working properly and are able to um, prevent that kind of infection. All right. So, since we know that the key to manufacturing a product that's a good microbiological control, or good microbiological quality, is control of the process, the sort of the theme I'd like to um, convey here today about the control of non-sterile products is the control in all steps of, of the process itself. So know what we're controlling. Think about what our product is in pharmaceutical development. Control in manufacturing, and also sort of our back-end checks in release and stability testing. All right, so there are a number of different types of non-sterile dosage forms. Tablets, creams, ointments, you know, many different types of products. And in our experience in looking at the different types of products that people manufacture, we've sort of broken them down into three really broad categories. Our first category is going to be the solid dosage forms, like tablets, things like that. And also we have the non-solid dosage forms, solid, non-solid. The non-solids are further differentiated by whether they are aqueous or non-aqueous. Now the major criteria that separates all three of these types of dosage forms is their water activity. All right? So water activity is a way to measure the amount of water that's biologically available. So the microorganisms could potentially, the amount of water that's available for microorganisms to use in their metabolism to grow, survive, proliferate, all that. And this is something that is very typically confused with the concept of water content. These are actually two distinct parameters, and water activity has a lot more biological relevance in this context. Now, if you'll allow me a quick example here, you think of something like jam or jelly. Think of something like that. It's a sort of an old way of, to control microorganisms in a product is to make jam or jelly out of fruit. Well, this is something that has a lot of water content. Think of how wet something like that feels. There's a lot of water in it. But in these jams and jellies, the water is actually bound up to the sugar that's present. So since the water is bound to sugar, it's not available for the microorganisms to use. So we would say that something like that had a high water content, but a low water activity. Generally, the lower the water activity, the less water is available for microorganisms to use, and therefore the product is of lower microbiological risk. Of course, on the flip side, something with higher water activity, water is freely available for the microorganisms to take in, and it's going to be of higher microbiological risk. They can survive, they can proliferate in the product, etc. So you can see from that what we really have on our spectrum of risk over here is by the arrow is that the higher risk products are going to be those that are aqueous and have that high water activity. Now, if this is a new concept and you're interested in learning more about it, USP's chapter 1112 has a very good write-up of it, something that you might want to take a look at. All right, so in our high-risk, our higher-risk aqueous products, the risk can be further differentiated on whether the formulation is growth-promoting, and it has plenty of things that the microorganisms want to eat and use to grow in it, or whether it's growth inhibiting, meaning that it contains substances that prevent that growth of microorganisms. You know, microbiologists don't usually have a lot of input in eliminating growth-promoting APIs or excipients from the product formulation. We're usually kind of, we're kind of stuck with that. But one thing that can help to mitigate the risk, if you have a highly growth-promoting formulation, uh, one thing that can mitigate that risk is going to be the addition of antimicrobial preservatives. Now, that's one reason that if a product is aqueous, it's intended for multiple dose, which most 
non-sterile products are, it must either contain a preservative, added preservative, or itself have self-preserving properties. And this is usually tested, this antimicrobial effectiveness testing is usually done using methods described in USP's Chapter 51. Um, and there are three categories, two, three, and four, apply to non-sterile products. Now, one thing that I wanted to point out that is if the product is preserved by the addition of an, an, of an extra preservative, it's important to do this effectiveness testing at the worst case. So at the lowest preservative content that's allowed for release and stability. All right, so we've talked about sort of the background nature of the product. What are we working with? What are our microbiological risks going in? So we know that at this point. Um, let's talk about the, some controls that can take place at the manufacturing facility to ensure um, that the end product is of good quality. I guess the first, sort of, you've got to sort of know your enemy, right? You've got to know where the microorganisms are coming from that can put your product at risk. Well, I hate to tell you, but they're coming at you from everywhere. They're ubiquitous in nature. They're present in the APIs and the excipients and the water, on the personnel in the facility, et cetera, et cetera. However, these are all aspects that can be controlled. The first step is going to involve the control of raw materials, API, excipients, water, things like that, that go into making the product. These are typically controlled, uh, typically controlled by the manufacturer of those respective substances. Um, many of the substances that are compendial do have microbial limits associated with their, uh, with their monograph, but if you're looking for sort of a good starting place, what to consider um, as something that's reasonable for some of these incoming products, USP's Chapter 1111 does recommend these, these types of limits. Control continues in the manufacturing environment. Um, of course, firms should be compliant with CGMPs. Of course, these aren't, like, the, the environment is not going to be stringently controlled as it would be for the manufacture of a sterile product. But of course, the control does need to be in place. Notably, most uh, non-sterile products are manufactured in an ISO 7 or grade C environment. Water systems can be very frustrating sources of contamination. So care should be taken to be sure that they're maintained and tested appropriately. Uh, we talked a little bit about sort of the idea of food and water for microorganisms. And we talked about development. Well. Microorganisms are pretty simple in what they need to both survive and proliferate in products. So all they really need is food, water, and time. So we know we can't do a whole lot to control food and water. That's kind of there and implicit in the formulation. But one good thing that we can control in the manufacturing environment is time. So not letting, un for example, unpreserved um, solutions sit around for long periods of time without being validated to see if they can maintain control. One other thing to note is that if a product has low water activity at the end, but it has an aqueous step upstream, that's an area where the product might be at risk for proliferation, end up contaminating the final product. All right, our last bit here talking about uh, the things that you do at the very back end to make sure that the controls that you have in place are adequate. So release and stability testing. So of course, if a product it contains a preservative, uh, release and stability testing should include both testing for preservative content and also antimicrobial effectiveness. Now the antimicrobial effectiveness test is, it's, a, it's a very long test. It's a microbiological test. And so people are always like, oh, we have to do that. But it's a good idea to at least, at the very minimum, develop a stability profile of the product by doing antimicrobial effectiveness testing over the product's shelf life. And once you have the idea of the product's stability profile, then that kind of testing can be, can be reduced over time. 
the numbers and types of microorganisms in the finished product should be, should be tested. Um, this is usually done by using compendial methods, including USP methods described in USP's Chapter 61, which allows us to count the microorganisms, and USP's Chapter 62, which allows us to confirm the absence of particular types of microorganisms. Well, that's fine, but these are just methods. 61 and 62, they all, those are the only methods. They don't have any acceptance criteria. So what should your acceptance criteria for the product be? And also, I know that a lot of you are familiar with the regulation that states that products should be free of objectionable microorganisms. Well, that leads us to the very difficult question of what exactly is an objectionable microorganism. That's not an easy answer, even for a microbiologist to tell you. So what has to be kept in mind is what is the patient population and what is the route of administration that your product is intended for. A good starting point uh, for considering acceptance criteria can be found in USP's 1111, which has recommended acceptance criteria broken down by route of administration. Sorry, that's a little bit fuzzy for us. Um, now, this is just a portion of the table, the full table that's in the chapter. But if you look there in the, in the chapter itself, there are actually a number of, uh, dose, of routes of administration with their respective acceptance criteria. However, one thing, one microorganism that is not on the list and is also not the methods in USP 62 are the members of the Burkholderia cepacea complex. All right, so these are microorganisms that are typically associated with water and aquatic environments. And the really troublesome thing about these guys is that they can survive, they really survive, they can grow in the presence of a lot of the common preservative systems. Very risky. Uh, they have some really significant pathogenic properties. So we recommend that uh, manufacturers of aqueous products do a risk assessment to determine uh, their product is at risk for contamination with these microorganisms. Uh, in addition to risk assessment and process control, product testing can allow another level of confidence that Burkholderia are absent from, um, from the product, but keeping in mind that there's no compendial test method for these species. So any kind of method must be fully validated. All right, time is growing short. And I know I've covered a lot of stuff today, haven't I? A lot, yeah, a lot of stuff. Well, I'm pleased to say that this is kind of the, um, this is kind of the trailer. This presentation is kind of the trailer. Because my colleagues and I have actually developed a, um, a, a uh, we put our current thinking that I'm just sort of conveying to you today here in writing. And we're very hopeful that FDA is going to publish this current thinking document in some form at some time this year. And this document is going to cover um, the topics that I discussed with you today, as well as a few other things that I just simply just didn't have time to cover. So please keep your eyes out for that, uh, hopefully this year. We're very excited about this being published. All right. So I hope really my one line summary is that you don't think, I hope you don't think that there's no need for the microbiologist to consider non-sterile drug products because there's really a lot of things that the microbiologist can help uh, with the consideration of risks for these products. And I thank you for your very kind attention this morning. And I look forward to interacting with you um, at the QA and my time is up, interacting with you at the QA session and also throughout the day. I hope you'll come up and speak to me if you have any questions. Thank you so much.